I am Michael Shermer, the director of the Skeptic Society and the publisher of Skeptic Magazine. This is our Science Salon series. Okay, so today's subject uh, is a, a long time uh, uh, interest of skeptics, uh, mainly because of the intersection between real science, that is the possibilities of extraterrestrial intelligence somewhere in the cosmos, and then pseudoscience, you know, the belief that they've, they've come here, there's no, there's no point in searching the heavens, they're already here. Uh, they may be amongst us today. Um, you know, the body snatchers, they're actually the reptilians and they look just like us and there's no way to know. Yeah, anyway, so, um, so between those two extremes, you know, the real science and the pseudoscience, and to me it's all, always been a, a, of interest of the kind of psychology of how science works, history of science, that you have these two social communities. Uh, you know, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence conducted by real physicists and astronomers and cosmologists and and then you have this other community of people that are not professional scientists yet believe passionately um, that, that you know, they, they, they're out there and they've come here. And uh, so it's always interesting to look at the kind of the dynamics of these two groups and how they process information or what they think of as, as evidence, what's legitimate evidence. And uh, so that, I thought we, we could get into that today. The book is UFOs, Chemtrails, and Aliens. Donald Prothero and Tim Callahan are the co-authors of this book, Indiana University Press. And uh, I wrote the foreword for it, so I, I, I love the book. It's a great subject. And, uh, and uh, Don is a longtime um, uh, author and skeptic with us, and uh, a paleontologist, a geologist, and somebody who's written quite a bit about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence and the possibilities of what they might look like, which we'll get into toward the end of today. And then Tim Callahan is a longtime religion editor for Skeptic Magazine. And what he brings in this book that I find so interesting is the idea of of uh, uh, sort of the, the mythos of aliens, what they stand for, what they represent, what science fiction means to us, why we make up these stories, whether they're true or not, is sort of a, a, separate, a, sec, a separate question. What, 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 why are we even asking the question? What does it mean to think of the, there's some, somebody out there that's more powerful than us, more moral than us, that cares about us. This theme comes up over and over, gods and aliens and angels and so on. Why does that happen? So. Uh, so I thought we'd start with sort of go go through three parts. The you know what are the claims and and how, how do we know they're not true or maybe maybe some of them are partially true. Roswell and you know the the believers think the evidence is pretty solid. So is it? Uh, and then I thought we'd get into um, the so, sort of the why people believe in these things because skeptics. Well, I hate to be the spoiler spoiler alert here, but you know we don't think aliens are here. Okay, <laughs> so just, just to put that out there. Uh, so, but, but why do people believe that they are? I mean, the polls consistently show, you know, a third to a half, two thirds, depending on how you ask the question, people believe that, you know, UFOs represent uh, real aliens that have come here. So why is that? What do they represent mythically? And then the, po the possibility that Don particularly specializes in is, you know, what, how would we find them if, we're, if they're out there? How would we know? And what will they look like? You know, in, in films, they always look like bipedal primates with some gnarly stuff on their forehead, and they speak English with an Indian <laughs> accent. And they fit into an actor. <laughs> yeah, yeah and, they, they, and they belong to the Screen Actors Guild, yeah. <laughs> you know, so, uh, so, so, so why is that? And what would they look like? I mean, Carl Sagan famously did not portray the aliens in contact uh, because who knows what they would look like? And, and so do we have some idea of what they would look like? Maybe they would be bipedal, bipedal or something like that. Anyway, so let's start with um, let's start with you, Don, and, and, and you, you start the book off with, you know, Area 51, and, and then some of the earlier, going back to you know the late 19th century. You know, what does it mean when 500 people say we saw it? So it's, right. I wasn't hallucinating. Right. Yeah. Actually, the very beginning of this book is a little anecdote that we put in at the beginning. It's a famous hoax that was uh, done in 1909 by a con man by the name of Wallace Tillingast, and he claimed to all the newspapers in New England that he had a flying ship, which is only six, six years after the Wright brothers had flown, and they at that time, and Glenn Curtis had a very primitive aircraft that could only fly a few, hour, a few uh, minutes and a, a few feet off the ground. He claimed he had an aircraft that could fly for hours with three people in it. But he claimed he could not fly it in the daytime because he was trying to win a competition, therefore he didn't want anyone to see his stuff and uh, steal his idea. So there he claimed <laughs> he was doing night flights over New England, got it all through the newspapers. And for weeks and weeks, people reported seeing this aircraft flying over them, hearing it flying over them, seeing it fly around the Statue of Liberty all over the place. And then the uh, night, day before Christmas, 1906, or 1909, finally someone got in behind it and found out it was all a hoax. 50,000 people all claimed they heard and saw these aircraft, and it never existed. 
And so if you have people saying, well, all these people saw this, the first answer you say, the great airship hoax in 1909, 50,000 people can be wrong. Right. Some, and similar to that is the uh, Phoenix Lights, where you know, people called in, they saw it, this, this slowly moving spaceship that was silent and it was V-shaped. They could tell that the lights were the leading edge because it blotted out the stars. And they weren't charlatans and they weren't... Uh, hallucinating. They weren't hallucinating, they weren't crazy people. They were just ordinary folks. Fortunately, we have videos. People took some videos and that's not what you see on the video. You see uh, lights come on then another light comes on, another one comes on, and comes on, and, and people are saying, well, look, there's another one. And then they wink off, just what you'd expect of, uh, of uh, torches dried the... Uh, there were flares, flares right? Flares, or, uh, flares dropped from right. uh, parachutes to illuminate a battlefield, which, which... And again, you'd have to wonder if all these people are uh, calling this in, why the nearby Air Force Base, where these planes were coming from, didn't scramble a bunch of jets to intercept this alien. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. And there was a second version of that hoax. It was actually a kid with a, a hot air balloon attached yeah. to fl uh, flares or candles. So oh. they did it twice. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> yes, right. There were two Phoenix lights. There were two yeah. Phoenix lights. Yeah. Yeah. About yeah. 10 years apart. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, when I was uh, going to uh, the Chouinard Art School in Los Angeles, we were going out for coffee one night and saw these guys and they had this cross piece of balsa wood cross piece with, with birthday cake candles on it, and they had a big laundry bag <laughs> on it, and they were letting it go, and it, and it floated up, just kind of, and when it got up high, you could just see this kind of glowing light, and it would move this way, and that way, and it, <laughs> you know, just it's however, and, and very so. Very easy to hoax, yes. So we decided we'd uh, add to it. We walked along and said, oh, did you see that UFO up there? And, uh, <laughs> and yes. a lot of people said, no, no, didn't see anything. <laughs> yeah, I think it's good to remember what the U in UFO stands for, unidentified. That doesn't mean extraterrestrial, it doesn't mean government cover-up, conspiracy theory, Area 51, it just means I don't know what I saw. Uh, and that's it, full stop. Right. But the problem is, I guess, uh, you know, our brain, our cognition is designed to fill in those gaps. Right. We have to keep remembering the unexplained is not necessarily unexplainable. Right? Just because we don't know the answer now in science, that doesn't mean we give up and say, oh, it's extraterrestrial, oh, it's religion. In science, we just say we just don't have the answer at this moment. We withhold judgment until more data comes in, and that's the problem. So many people don't withhold judgment. They jump to conclusions rather than letting the data sit as unexplained but not mysterious. Right? That's a, that one of the jokes about this whole thing is that all you have to do is say mystery in uh, any kind of late night cable show. Mm -hmm. And it will always get these people jumping to paranormal conclusions when in fact, lots of mysteries of the uh, late night cable actually have been solved and they won't mention that. Or if they really are unexplained, fine. They're unexplained, but they're not paranormal yet. Or you assign graduate students to figure it out, <laughs> in your case. <laughs> well, I mean, really science is, is, is in the job of filling gaps. So the unexplained is what we need. Right. Just to keep pushing the envelope out there. So I let's talk about uh, Ro Roswell, I guess, because that's okay. kind of become the mother of all UFO sightings. Although, if I recall, in the f 60s, I think there was a poll of like the most 500 most important UFO sightings yeah. of the previous decades, and it wasn't even on. That no, wasn't the, even on it. Not on until the top. 1968, did they finally? Roswell's an interesting story, of course, because it's as we tried to describe in the book. It's one that has been blown up gigantically from what the original story was. In fact, it was a story that was completely forgotten until 1968 and then resurrected by the UFO cultists and made into what it is now based on no additional evidence. It was all just, it, the, the foundation of it was right after the World War II and the, during the Cold War in 1947, they were floating these balloons that had an array of tinfoil-like things at the bottom and their device was intended to try to, uh, to detect a Soviet nuclear blast coming around the planet. And so this is one of many experiments that the military ran, and top secret, of course, in order to find out if they could tell when the Soviets were running uh, big nuclear tests. And one of those arrays, it was uh, called, um, I can't bring blank in the name now. Um, anyway, one of those arrays was released. They know the exact date it was released. They know where it was released from. The people in the project, even though they were top secret then, have all come forward and say it, was, it hit a lightning storm over a town between Roswell and, and the area and then crash landed, and it was just a balloon with a bunch of tin foil and some paint, uh, tape that had a flower pattern on it and everything on it. And they, they initially, when the rancher who was there, the French foreman, picked it up, he didn't think it was a UFO. It wasn't until he went into town 
and he heard about the buzz because that happened by coincidence to be the year that somebody started the great craze about flying saucers. Although the pilot who, who got the craze started didn't say he saw flying saucers. He said he saw aircraft, what looked like kind of aircraft moving this, like they were skipping stones or skipping saucers. Oh, yeah. And then it got conflated into they looked like saucers because everyone had seen them in comic books before then. So yeah. the entire night, summer of 1947, everyone was seeing flying saucers that didn't exist. This guy comes into town. He decides what he's found must be a flying saucer. So weird coincidence of two different things. And then the military confiscated it. All the pictures show exactly what the people in the project were doing. They've actually come forward to identify that's what it was. And then it was pretty much died after 1947. And nobody thought about it for a good 30 years plus afterwards. It wasn't even in the listing of all the reports of UFOs in 1947 that during the flying saucer craze, it was never mentioned. And so it had been forgotten, and only like one or two surviving people around when the, uh, Stanton Freeman and some others in 1978 brought their you know, interviews out and started to try to get all this revived. And then it just exploded into this giant cult that has no connection to the original witnesses, no connection to the original data. And of course, some of the original witnesses that we had an article actually in Skeptic Magazine, it was heavily my source for this chapter, was one of the guys who actually ran the project and said, this is what it was. We released it, we know what it looks like. And he said, you can identify it because it has a flower pattern on the tape. They, bu they bought it at some kid's store. And it's not alien <laughs> writing, it's just flowers and other designs. How that became the calligraphy of the alien. Yeah, that's right, some it's kid's flower pattern, yes. And that somehow the, the, the aliens traversed the, traversed, the, traversed the vast distances of interstellar space with balsa wood yep. and tinfoil. I yeah, mean, this right. is the, uh, yeah, okay, so. Oh, the, the Gilbert says it very well when he reviews the you know, These are supposedly very advanced aliens who can travel across interstellar space are so advanced that they blunder right into the Mecto desert <laughs> and leave almost no traces of themselves and everything else. It's just it's, it's bizarre you know, that anyone took that seriously to begin with. But now it, just, it has its own life. It's a, it's, you say the word Roswell and everybody believes all this garbage they've seen in all sorts of cult shows, none of which is supported by evidence or any original witnesses of her left that would kind of support it. And on top of that, of course, everybody in Roswell makes a big buck off of it as well. You visit the town, which I have, it's all aliens everywhere you go in town, right? The light posts, they're signposts, they have museums for alien culture. Uh, you, you, you basically, they, they take your money by getting you to Roswell in the first place, and then they make money off of you. So really, Roswell is a story of myth-making. Classic and it, example. And it's recent enough we can kind of see the origin and right. then the development, unlike ancient religions, which are lost in the right. mists of time. Here we can see you know, this newspaper story on that particular date. Right. And then, so uh, I think it was the made-for-TV movie about Roswell or something. Yeah, or, one of those, yeah. That, that really launched it. Right. And then the alien autopsy fraud, which came not long after that, <laughs> where they claimed they had an alien body, and of course this guy Centilli who did it was the hoaxer and the whole thing. He was finally exposed a year or two later after he'd gotten all this publicity and gotten on TV. And then, to show you the, how the, me the media works, then they ran the story about the alien autopsy as the world's greatest hoaxes. Right. <laughs> after they've been hoaxed themselves. Right. <laughs> So a story becomes a story. But let's go back in time, Tim, a little bit to uh, decades, really, I guess the 1920s, 30s of science fiction and the pulp magazines and the, uh, you know, the cover art. You've got to put something on the cover of these pulp magazines. Right. So artists start depicting what UFOs look like or what aliens yeah. look like. And that's really how the myth mythos begins. Yeah, particularly uh, Frank R. Paul and uh, uh, Pat Lindsay used his, uh, his uh, artwork on one uh, issue of Skeptic Magazine, and uh, he made these saucer-shaped things, mainly, and uh, they were on these magazines in the 1920s, uh, and there's uh, tractor beams coming down. That was something that E. e. Doc Smith, uh, the early science fiction writer, came up with, with these yeah. tractor beams, which appear again in, in the Star Trek uh, yeah. TV series. So, but, but tractor, I mean, like a farm instrument? Is that <laughs> a tractor or to, or to pull? Oh, it's tracting. Oh, yeah, like, like, a, like a tractor pulls oh, something. Oh. So you, they focus this beam and suck you up. And okay. And so that that's, that that's really a begins. popular meme now in that little genre. Of so that was 1920s. Yeah. 1920s, yeah. And there's a Buck Rogers comic strip that shows cat-like aliens abducting Buck's uh, girlfriend. They don't have a tractor beam. They have a, a big claw that comes out and grabs right. her. <laughs> right. And there's something interesting about that. If you really want to 
challenge someone who is a believer in these things, ask them why there were no aliens like you see, claim to see they looked like reported before about uh, 1870 or 1880. And the reason, of course, is that people saw mysterious objects in the sky before then. They called them angels or demons. Right. Or they, were, right. they put it into the cultural myth of their culture, which is usually a supernatural religion. And then what's interesting about it is that virtually every report of aliens is influenced by whatever the culture is at the time it's reported and it changes with a changing culture. So when sci-fi came along in the late uh, 19th century, sci-fi sort of replaced religion as explaining weird things you see in the sky. Mm -hmm. Then all these alien reports, I mean the first real published version of what an alien looked like is of course War of the Worlds, with H.G. Wells. They don't look like uh, E.T. They look like sort of octopus-like creatures, okay? Mm -hmm. But you don't see anyone talking about those anymore because the culture has changed the meme. And so thanks to uh, Steven Spielberg, now we all see the little gray, which is borrowed as Tim found from an episode of Outer Limits, the Bolero Shield. Yeah. So these are all cultural stealings. And then once the culture saturates with a particular image of what an alien should look like, everybody has that in their memory and that's what they see. Um, well, of course, the ufologists say that's only because <laughs> they can only explain it with the imagery and words they have in their culture. The thing they're describing is really there. So if you lived 2,000, 3,000 years ago and aliens came, you wouldn't call them aliens, you'd call them angels. Mm. But they're really aliens. This is their <laughs> argument. So, yeah. so I guess then it's almost an epistemological question of what, we co what constitutes good evidence. Right. Because that's a, that's a reasonable argument. Like, okay, yeah, they wouldn't know what how to would call you, how it. How would you test it? As yeah. a scientist, yeah. can't, do, can't test it, therefore it's not science. So. Uh, although I guess in, in some of the ancient art or medieval art, you know, where you see these little doohickey things in the sky, mm -hmm. you know, the ancient aliens go, you see, that's an actual UFO, and they were, yeah. but, but, but it has <laughs> yeah. a different origin, right? Yeah, there's a, 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 a great article in Skeptic that we used uh, as uh, some of our research, uh, and I, have, I think it was a cover art also on it, that uh, about uh, Renaissance and medieval paintings where uh, angels are depicted and they look like, like flying saucers. Well, one, one of the really funny ones was that <laughs> There's, uh, I think it's St. Jerome is uh, kneeling and praying and on the ground as a supposedly a red UFO. It's got this <laughs> disc shape and a little hump in it. And what it is actually is a cardinal's hat. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be right. medieval to recognize it, yes. <laughs> so it helps to have some historical context yeah, for what these art images really mean, yeah. or else you're gonna fill it in with your own brain. Um, well, you know, so there's thousands of books on UFOs, and they claim there's tons of evidence. Obviously, Roswell's an easy one. But I, I find it interesting that the, the, the serious ufologists agree with us that 90 to 95 percent of all the sightings are explicable. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's swamp gas, it's planet Venus, it's the moon, or, 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 or uh, weather balloons, yep. advertising planes, Flares, birds. Yeah. Birds tend to fly in those sort of triangular shape. Yeah, the light and, on. Uh, I saw one out in the desert once um, during a, a, a long bike race out in uh, the Mojave Desert, and you know it was dark on the on the ground, but but the sun had not completely set, so you could see satellites, for example, but you could see yeah. birds, uh, and it, it really it looked like a U, you know a UFO. I'm like, oh, I'm hallucinating again. <laughs> 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 I need to, I need to take a break. No. Uh, but, but really, it, uh, you, you sort of fill it, so if the birds are, are flying in formation, in sort of a V formation, it's easy for the eye to kind of fill in that last right. line. Right. And it's dark here, so all you see is, you know, reflected light. And, you know, so they agree that, okay, that, that was geese or whatever, not a, a, not a UFO. Um, so then it comes down to the, 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 what do you do with that 5%? That's right. And this is the problem of, there's always anomalies in science, Correct. right? There are always anomalies, and the, again, as, as we said at the beginning, the unexplained is not necessarily unexplainable. We reserve judgment until enough evidence is clear, or we just put it in a category of still not unexplained. There's also a, a psychological need, I think, right. to explain. And Humans would rather explain things, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, one uh, unexplained thing that will probably remain unexplained is the Mary Celeste, this sloop in the late 19th century was found full sail. Uh, the crew, which was a small crew, was gone. And a lifeboat was gone. So they probably, they don't know why they abandoned ship. There's all kinds of great theories, but the reality is we'll never know. 
And, right. Uh, it's unlikely any more evidence will ever come right, up at this point. Just, uh, and the science has those cases where they're just dead ends, right? They're cold mm -hmm. case. You know, we, we have to live with that. So. Yeah. I mean, creationists always do this. Dawkins makes that argument that, you know, if he can't explain the evolution of the left elbow of the Amazonian frog, therefore creationists. That's right. <laughs> Black and white view of the world, yeah. And, you know, the Holocaust deniers do that. If you can't explain, this, one of the challenges to me, that, you know, why the door on the gas chamber at the at, at Madhouse and doesn't lock, therefore they didn't gas anybody there, therefore they didn't gas anybody anywhere, therefore there was no Holocaust. Wait. <laughs> it's just this, we just have this question about this one little thing here. Yeah. And really, the entire UFO thing kind of kind of piles up on those little anomalies that, if you really look, a lot, most of them are explicable, but there's yeah. just some that we just can't quite get at. Right. So then it really becomes a matter of educating people on how science works. Right. Like, you know, it's okay right. just to have these mysteries. In fact, it's great to have these unexplained mysteries. And we know just being comfortable with not knowing, okay? Yeah. That's the problem humans have. We want to know, and if we don't have a good explanation, we will supply it. <laughs> and any source is fine, and usually it comes from whatever our culture gives us the way of uh, ammunition to supply that explanation, but it doesn't usually necessarily have evidence supporting it, and of course, a lot of times it's not scientific, and that's what we found ourselves saying over and over again in this book, is we can only do what science allows us to do. And one of the basic rules of science, especially certain kinds of science, is what's called Occam's razor. Uh, some of you have heard of it before, the principle of parsimony. Never make a more complicated explanation for something when a simpler one will do. And so, for example, there are all sorts of people who believe that aliens cross huge interstellar distances just to draw patterns in people's fields and make crop circles, and then vanished without leaving any trace of themselves. Just, to me, it just blows my mind that anyone would think that's plausible, especially because most crop circles have now all been exposed as hoaxes. The people who played the prank and showed how they did it usually take a board and a rope and a stake, yeah. and they can make any field, kind of pattern of field you like, and they do it in the middle of the night so no one witnesses it, and then lo and behold, the media are full of stories of crop circles that aliens made. And this is why it startles me that people can buy into this stuff, because that is the most silly of all the silly beliefs I've ever heard them. The, uh, uh, along that line, the, the Julia set crop circle is a particularly notable one, and it shows how the myth sort of uh, perpetuates itself. And, and when you, Which one is that? That's the one where it's, this, it's kind of a, a thing that's near Stonehenge, and yeah. people claim that they saw this whirling cloud above it, and it and it, they saw it form, and, hmm. and when you look into it, you find uh, the woman who said it, uh, Lucy Pringle, I think her name is, she got it from somebody else who was told that, that she heard it from a taxi driver who oh. saw it. Right. So it's kind of like... <laughs> Gave a telephone, right. yes. And, it's, yeah, right. yeah, and, and, it's, and then somebody came out and said, no, we, we made this, we, we did this, we did it the night before. It wasn't during the day. And one of the problems was there was a plane flying over, and there's the uh, thing where we don't notice things oftentimes, uh, even though there was right in front of us. There's like the, the famous uh, gorilla. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, attention blindness. Yeah, attention, attention blindness, blindness, yeah. And so a plane flew over it, uh, over Stonehenge, uh, a private pilot showing a tourist Stonehenge from the air. And then they came back, and then they saw this, the crop circle, and they assumed, oh, this thing was made between when we flew yeah. over the first time and when we flew over the second time. Oh, right. But he wasn't looking for it the first time. That's right. right. <laughs> yeah, so one of the little skeptic tools that uh, we like to talk about is that you know, pe people will say this is what they saw, but when you deconstruct it, you find out that they're, it's not that they're exaggerating like the fisherman tells the, the story over and over, it gets bigger, but, but that often they'll say, well, this is what happened when in fact it, it didn't happen that way at all. But by way of example, magicians will, if you show uh, people a magic trick and then say, explain what you just saw, they'll retell what they saw in a way that not only is incorrect, but in a way that he couldn't have done it that way. Right. So that it seems like real magic. Yeah. And then um, I remember when we first started, uh, Ray Hyman was as a psychologist, University of Oregon psychologist, who had been, been investigating Uri Geller, the spoon bender. And Uri, when they would test Uri, of course it didn't work because they put controls on him. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Uri would, but to naive people, he would say something like, well, it's not working now, but you know, last night I did this incredible thing, and he would then describe this amazing thing he did. And then the people that watched, they would describe what he said he did the night before <laughs> as the thing that they saw with their own eyes. Right. 
And it's, it's a sort of an interesting phenomenon that we, we want to retell the story in a way that scientists can't explain it. Right. right. And that's something we, we make a point of early in the book. Is the, the one thing we did, not many other books about UFOs do this, is the first chapters are all about these topics, about evidence and the quality of evidence and what scientific method is and why we can't do certain kinds of things and why paranormal is not science especially. And one of the things, of course, we focused on is this business of eyewitness testimony. Like an example I talked about at the very beginning of the hoax where 50,000 people claimed they saw and heard stuff we know didn't happen. Humans are terrible re video recorders. Mm -hmm. Okay, What we think we saw, even in the short term after we claim we saw it, is already full of gaps, or we filled in gaps, or we started to modify it. And the longer it goes from the time we claim we saw it till somebody hears our story, the more likely we replaced a lot of details with more details. Uh, Elizabeth Loftus, who's yes. a, 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 a famous been a, get, a guest at this society many times, is one of the leading psychologists who's shown that humans are terrible at re remembering what actually happened. And therefore, we are always putting in a lot of stuff, especially stuff that we have been conditioned to see rather than what was actually there. Also, and, yeah, go ahead, Tim. Yeah, biased reporting, like that. Elizabeth Loftus mentioned one point where they had a, an experiment where they showed people a traffic accident. And right. they had the people estimate the speed that the cars were going. And they said, uh, what was the speed the cars are going when they uh, collided? And uh, if they changed the wording, so how fast were they going when they smashed into each other? They right. Smashed in was this thing. And, and people universally Up the speed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, one of the rules we laid down very early in the book is that eyewitness evidence is virtually not evidence at all. And when you reach that point, you really undermine almost the entire UFOlogist thing because virtually all of what they have to show is no physical evidence at all, right? Nothing that can't be easily explained by other causes, which Tim described of many of those in the, in the book. But especially, it's almost all eyewitness testimony. That's what they base almost everything on. And we know now that that's the worst possible. Even courts of law now are, are degrading what they think of eyewitness evidence, and they're, they're trusting things like DNA far more than eyewitnesses because eyewitnesses can be and usually are wrong in situations like this. All right, as a professional working scientist, what would it take for you to accept the alien hypothesis? It would, it would have to be objects that could not be explained by any other way and had to be independently tested by skeptical scientist groups. In so other words, make sure it wasn't Copperfield making right. this, <laughs> yeah. making the alien appear in your backyard. Well, tell them the story about the, uh, the strange uh, object that was made from the grinder that uh, people, oh, yeah. yeah, that story's in his chapter. Which, uh, which also, uh, uh, Pat Lindsay wrote uh, an article about it for Skeptic before I had the uh, the Bob White artifact. All Supposedly, right. Bob White and a young female companion were driving uh, out in the desert between Colorado and Nevada, and they saw something in the sky, and it shot this something out of it. And they found this strange artifact that looks, well, it's... Like a metal stalactite, basically. Yeah, yeah, metal stalactite, and it's very organic looking. And he and uh, so he sent uh, you know sent metal samples into various labs and they said gee this is a alloy we've never seen before it's just a, this real mix weird mix of metals and uh, as, as is brought out in Pat Lindsay's article uh, what it is is uh, residue from a stationary grinder a metal grinder that when they grind little bits of metal fly off and it's molten and it sticks and forms, essentially form a stalactite, yep. essentially. And it uses it, together, yeah. And of course it's an unusual alloy right. because it isn't an alloy, it's just a mishmash of... Whatever they happen to grind at the time. So he found that on the ground when he went to look for something else. Supposedly, or, he said he found oh, it. And, uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know, yeah. you know, we, we really can't, can't test that, but... Yeah, it's just his word then. What, what about the implants people say that they have? And they, they went to the surgeon, they took it out, it's this little piece of metal. Well, you, you, you did the story on where that came from. Go ahead. Uh, well, I think the, uh, the earliest implant story what was the, the thing that uh, earliest. Now, oh, yes. Uh, in 1953, there was this movie, it was really kind of creepy. It was, it's called Invaders from Mars. Yeah. And if you remember it, there's out in back of the house where the astronomer lives and he's got this bright young boy and the young boy sees a UFO land and bury itself in the sand pit and then if you go out there then and walk across the sand pit there he says this, oh, noise. <laughs> and, 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 and 
and the sand goes away. It's like an ant lion. They fall into it, and then they come back out. They're very changed. They're <laughs> controlled. And there's a telltale red scab on the back, and a, a really great paranoia movie. He goes to, to try to tell it to the chief of police, and the chief of police isn't interested, and he turns around to answer the phone. You see the red scab. <laughs> and and uh, so, you know, it's it the idea that aliens could implant right. something. Right, and, right. Uh, so that's where that myth took yeah, off. Yeah, yeah. That, so, that's one so of the main. But what does it people find? Just splinters or just, just, just pieces of metal. stuff, stuff you know, that ends they, up in your they body? Say, they'll say, oh, it's, they'll, they'll show you some website, something that looks like some little microelectronic thing, but yeah. usually it's just barely under the skin and uh, it's just a piece of metal. Right, yeah. Yeah. So. that happens periodically. Yeah. yeah. And, and the raise of the larger point, and, and Tim did a good job researching this, almost every meme you hear about aliens, you can trace it to some sci-fi movie, TV show, or sometimes before that, comic books. Mm -hmm. It's almost entirely launched by this or that or this movie. So the Bolero Shield uh, gave birth to E.T., okay? And that story gave right to the implants. And our culture's absorbed all these and forgotten where they came from. Mm -hmm. So now they're part of a universal UFO mythology, all of which you can trace to its original sources in science fiction. Right. Like the day the earth stood still has become kind of a classic. Oh, yeah, which I, so. I love that. I mean, it's kind of a Christ allegory. Yeah. You know, where the uh, lots the, of symbolism there. Yeah. Probably the source of uh, the Nordic aliens who look like us and who were benign and uh, so on. So, so. Because he was tall and slender and tall. Yeah, tall and slender. You know, human looking and. And then he had the robot character as well. Yeah. 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 And then the irony was that was sort of the Cold War meme for aliens. Mm -hmm. And then thanks to Spielberg and the uh, Bolero Shield, now we have the little you know big-eyed E.T. type aliens, and now everyone believes that's what this should look like, but again, that's not what HGOLs wrote about a century ago. Right. Yep, so what people see in their dreams or their, uh, their uh, sleep paralysis or whatever they're experiencing is inculcated from the memories of TV shows they've seen. Right. Images well, you, on book covers. Why don't you tell us a story about being captured by the UFOs on the uh, cross-country bike ride? You're oh, well, I... <laughs> <laughs> Yes, the aliens got it. Well, so, uh, I, I mean, this story I've told often that, you know, again, being a long-distance cyclist is not good for your mind. Uh, <laughs> and uh, sleep deprivation is not. Turns out, actually, this is a fairly common phenomenon for people that, like, solo sailors, solo flyers, uh, alpinists, long-distance long uh, runners, the Iditarod dog sledders, they all hallucinate like crazy. Usually a sense presence of somebody else in the room. So there's something about our cognition that generates these images that are here with us, when you're, particularly when you're alone, fatigued, sleep deprived, oxygen deprived, hungry, and so forth, anxious. Uh, we concoct these uh, sense presences as a way of, well, we don't really know why. Maybe it, it, it reduces anxiety. You know, it, maybe there's an evolutionary origin to it. Maybe it's an artifact, who knows. But it, it, but it appears pretty, pretty common. And uh, so in my case, I, I was you know, sleep deprived. I'd, I'd ridden a bike from Santa Monica to, to Nebraska nonstop uh, with, a, with a support team behind me. Uh, this part of Race Across America that we started in 1982. And uh, so it's, it's coast to coast and everybody uh, has a support team. So you have a van and a motorhome that follows behind you. So in my case, it was like three in the morning and I'm just sort of weaving down the road, falling asleep just from riding 1,200 miles without stopping and, uh, or sleeping. Because I'd read the year before about a UCLA student that had la it lasted 11 days without sleep in, in a sleep lab. So I thought, okay, maybe I could break wow. his record. <laughs> well, I, I he couldn't. wasn't exerting himself. No, like no, no, no. So I, I, I couldn't make it. Uh, but, but at that moment, so, so basically, my support team comes up next to me in the van with bright lights and, and, and stuff. And at that moment, I just clicked into this um, TV show from my childhood called The Invaders, starring Roy Thinnes. I believe it was a CBS series, where the aliens, it was a body snatchers type thing, where the aliens were coming here and taking over the bodies of your neighbors and friends and so on, so you didn't notice. Yeah. Except the, the one clue was they had stiff little fingers. <laughs> uh, you know, somehow the aliens could clone humans perfectly, but they couldn't get the ligament thing down in the... <laughs> in the but it, there has to be some, like the thing in the back of the neck, yeah. there has to be some plot gimmick right. to yeah. alert the viewer, this is one of the bad guys. <laughs> so every week this guy would you know, go through the town and look for the stiff fingers and so on. Uh, anyway, so that, that was what I thought, and that all the people standing there, 
my friends and family and so on who were on my crew, these were the aliens, and I knew that they were the aliens. <laughs> uh, but I knew that they didn't know that I knew. <laughs> so, you know, I'm quizzing them, you know, on technical aspects of my bike to my mechanic, and the aliens had really done their homework. They knew all about <laughs> the mechanics of my bike. Um, anyway, so apparently this went on for quite some minutes until they finally talked me into taking a nap for 90, <laughs> 90 minutes, and then, boom, I'm like, well, that was interesting. Uh, you know, of course, you know, waking up. So that's my missing time. You know, abductees talk about missing time. I think they just fell asleep. Uh, really, that's it, and that's where the action happens. Is, right. you know, and then, so about you know, you, if you read the alien abduction literature, you know, about half of it is uh, hypnosis induced, and well, probably not quite, much, but most of it is sleep sleep paralysis or some kind of sleep right. uh, hallucinations, and uh, and so again, you fill in. For my case, it was just a TV show from my childhood. So depending on who you're talking to, what things they've seen right. gets and, uh, inculcated. I think the sleep paralysis also. Uh, has a lot to do with the menace of it because in sleep paralysis, the, it's, it's a mechanism to keep us from acting out our dreams and, and you know, sleepwalking and such. That while we're asleep and dreaming, are, we're somewhat disconnected at the level of the pons where the uh, spinal cord hooks up to the brain. And so if you are in the middle of a dream and wake up in it, your pons are still blocked and you have a feeling of shortness of breath because you're breathing shallowly and you try to take deeper breaths and you can't because it's not connected up yet and you can't move and then of course you've got that weird thing that the, where you sense a presence in the room. And, uh, so. Yeah, usually it's described as sort of a dark amorphous mm -hmm. but scary anxiety producing mm -hmm. thing, entity of some sort. It, has, it had religious explanations a century ago and now it right. has aliens. <laughs> Right, so we have these narratives from the Middle Ages. These were incubi and succubi harassing mm -hmm. people in their yep. beds at night. Yep. And now it's the aliens. That's right. Um, yeah, so that kind of does touch on uh, the stuff you, t you wrote about, Tim, um, on uh, the, sort of the, the mythos of it all. Mm -hmm. So let's go back uh, even further and just talk about you know, humans, why humans believe in gods. I mean, in a way, I mean, aliens are kind of gods, right? And For the 20th I mean, century. The 20th is, is there yeah. a connection between humans believing in aliens and humans believing in gods? Yeah, well, I think <clears throat> basically we have to have something to explain. We, we are, as you've said, uh, story producing uh, entities and we, and we organize everything and uh, rather than we're just here and we don't know how we got here or why we're here or what it's about. We construct a story. We're here uh, that because the gods or God made us and usually the one of the uh, classic thing is, is, is just about every culture across the world uh, has a story of why we die <laughs> because it's kind of inexplicable to us. I mean, you know, intellectually I know I'm going to die someday. What? What? <laughs> Happy birthday, by the way. <laughs> Happy birthday, Tim. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. A year but, older, yes. Yeah. But, uh, but the, uh, you know, emotionally, the idea of the universe being around without me in it, it doesn't sound quite right. So we have to have an explanation. Why, would, why do we die? And everybody has, because the most common form is the uh, failed or, or perverted message that uh, God or the gods send down a messenger to the human being saying, if when one of you dies, uh, they think when the, the United States Austriacs and Siberia say, put the body in a, in a basket woven of grass and hang it in a tree, and after a week or so it'll come back to life. Uh, the Evo in West Africa say, just sprinkle some dust on it. And, and either the, the messenger, either through incompetence or malice, tells the wrong thing. Says, God says, when one of you dies, bury him and he'll stay dead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. And, uh, you know. But it's kind for, of a resurrection myth then. Yeah, well, f forbidden fruit is another one. But there was always some reason like, that we really should have lived forever. Uh, but the most benign one is one of the newer people of Sudan. And God says to them, do you want to live forever and they say well no we can't do that the world's already getting too crowded some of us will have to die so the new people come in and so, <laughs> right <laughs> sounds very modern actually yeah it's a very very nice uh, 
It reminds well, uh, me of Christopher Hitchens' comments about when he was dying, literally. Yeah. That, you know, it's like somebody taps you on the shoulders and says, you have to leave the party now. Okay, <laughs> that's bad enough, but then, and the party's going to go on without you, and they're all going to have fun. It's like, oh, no. <laughs> and, and, but then he said even worse would be like, he described heaven as celestial North Korea. You know, you have like this, <laughs> this omniscient, omnipotent thing that knows everything you're doing and controls you. It's like, ooh, that doesn't sound good. So he said that would be like somebody tapping you on the and the party goes on forever, and you can't leave. Well, I don't want to stay at the party forever. <laughs> it's a long time, especially near the end. So uh, anyway, so I guess we do concoct these. But, but, but the aliens are always these sort of godlike, more advanced than us, mm -hmm. right. more powerful. They know we're here. They care about us, or they threaten us, or something. But they have a relationship with us. Right. That yeah. seems godlike. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It very much ties the religion ideas into what we have, a so, modern religion, basically. Yeah. I mean, so when you start to think about it, Scientology is kind of a UFO oh, cult. Oh, it is. It is a UFO cult. Mormonism is yeah. kind of a, yeah. you get your own planet when yeah. you die. Yeah. And they, uh, the ones that all committed ritual suicide because they thought they were going to go behind Heaven's the, Gate, Heaven's Gate right. cult. Yeah. You know, there's a lot, of, and Jim pointed a lot, of, a lot of connections. A uh, whole bunch of religious cult leaders who often uh, adopt these uh, various mantles of having alien the pet powers or having come from another thing or communicate with an alien uh, almost the way they would say in the old days they communicated with God or an angel. Now it's aliens came and told me this and I am the prophet. And so the boundaries between what's religion and what's UFOlogy are very fuzzy. <laughs> would you go so far as say Christianity is a kind of, not UFO cult, but it would be something like an extraterrestrial intelligence of super powers mm -hmm. comes down and saves us from ourselves? Or well, is that going too far? I think I might be going a little too far. So <laughs> remember, there's so many versions of Christianity, you have to be specific yeah. then. So, <laughs> I mean, certainly the Mormons do have that, and certainly Scientology does. So. Right, right. But what I'm getting at is, there, you know, it's just, again, this idea, the psychology of, I'm not, we're not alone. Right. You know, the, the, so it gets to this problem of that we're uh, we're aware that everyone we know is going to die, and therefore I guess we are. I guess I am, but I can't imagine what it's like to be dead. You can't literally imagine it. You know, so if I say, imagine you're dead, you know, people concoct. Well, I see myself there in the casket, and all the people are around mourning, hopefully, <laughs> uh, and, and, and so on. But of course, you wouldn't see any of that, because if you're dead, you, you don't see anything. It's just nothing. You, you just go from something to nothing, which you can't imagine. It's, it's impossible. Right. So it sets up something of a paradox. I know I'm going to die. I can't even imagine what that means. So now what? Yeah. So you kind of concoct narratives around that to make life meaningful in yeah. some way, one of which would be well, maybe I'm going to die, but there's some afterlife, or there's something that continues, right. or there's something else bigger, grander out there that that is going to settle all this uh, and, and make make it meaningful somehow. Yeah. Now, there's a very clever Ricky Gervais movie called The Invention of the yeah, Lion, yeah, yeah. I believe is the title. Yeah, it's a great and movie. And through the beginning of the movie, Gervais is a writer for TV shows, and they're never allowed to do anything but strictly factual stuff because nobody ever tells an untruth, and there is no such thing as fiction. So everything is boring documentaries. And then he discovers after his mother is dying, he tells her that she's going to go to a better world. And that's when he realizes that lying makes people feel better. And lying makes people have comfort. And you know, an untruth sometimes helps people to get along. And so then he goes back to his work and starts writing these bizarre fictional episodes. And suddenly he's a huge hit because it's so much more interesting than the boring truth. <laughs> But, but I mean, just I don't want to pound this too much, but I mean, in The Day the Earth Stood Still, uh, Klaatu, the uh, Michael Rennie character, yeah. you know, his name in the movie is Mr. Carpenter, on Earth, his earthly name is Mr. Right. Carpenter, so right. okay, that seems like he's a Jesus. <laughs> yeah. but, he is that, so but he has that kind of uh, 60s, uh, tall, lanky, handsome Jesus look uh, uh, at the time, and, and, the, and the message is one of, you know, you, you guys are sinners, it, nuclear weapons in this particular mm -hmm. case. The remake with Keanu Reeves, it was global warming yeah. was our, was our <laughs> original sin. The meme lives forever. You just yes, yeah. that's yes. right. Yeah, whatever. So it's kind of a reflection of what we what we're anxious about. But mm -hmm. but in a way, it's it's like it's like this is original sin. I mean, this is Jesus comes down. You're original sinners, but I am going to sacrifice myself for you. And he does. He's killed by the authorities. And then uh, they take him to the morgue, and they put him in the morgue, and the Patricia Rennie character has to go to Gort the robot and give him these instructions to go rescue him out of the morgue, uh, which is 
Klaatu Barada Nikto. Nikto. Klaatu Barada Nikto. So <laughs> the robot goes and does this and brings it back to life. Boom. You know, he's on the yeah. slab yeah. and he does some stuff with the lights and the spooky 50s music. Then he comes back to life. And, and, and the Patricia Neal character says, you mean this is the power of the future of science and technology is to bring people back to life? And in the original yeah. script, he says, yes. All right. <laughs> and then the Breen, yeah, the Breen censorship board said, no, no, you can't say that to Americans. They'll freak out because you know, they're too religious. So in, this, in, the, in the film, he says something like, no, no, only the great spirit in the sky yeah, can do that. Only the creator can do that. Yeah, so. But really, it's a uh, you know it's the you know he, he's 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 killed by the authorities. He's brought back to yeah. life. He delivers his message, you know that you guys are sinners, and if you don't get your act straight, you know we're going to send a bunch of these robots to to to, to take care of you. And then he ascends to heaven. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to me, it just feels like <laughs> this is what Christianity's ultimate message is: is yeah, there's somebody yeah. out there that knows we're here, and they're kind of watching to keep track of how we're doing. Yeah. It's odd too because that that was a popular mythos of the '50s and the Cold War mentality. But since the late '70s, now we're 40 years since Close Encounters of the Third Kind came out. That now is a prevailing meme, and I'm not sure what religious imagery you want to yeah, apply. Right, the the right. little grays that seem to be made more famous. Right. And in that light, it's interesting. There's a very funny cartoon that we uh, talked about in our book where he talks about how the the presence that everybody now walks around with a camera that can photograph and videotape at any time. And the number of sightings of things like Bigfoot and ghosts and UFOs has <laughs> right. gotten less yeah. rather right. than more mm -hmm. as we have more cameras available to us. And according to several sources we heard from, apparently Spielberg no longer believes in aliens simply for that reason. Oh, really? Even though oh. he, in fact, of course, he probably would. more than any one person on this earth, made everyone believe in E.T. Mm -hmm. and right. the, the, the Belaro Shield version, the little gray alien. Mm -hmm. Right. So. Yeah, so that that's, brings up the question of the evidence of absence versus absence of evidence. So along those lines, I thought it was interesting that of uh, the big data dump by WikiLeaks, yeah. you know, hundreds of thousands of government secret documents, right. not a single mention of 9-11 as an inside job, no Roswell, no hiding the yeah. bodies in yeah. Area 51. None of the stuff that, you know, we've, that conspiracy theorists talk about are being hidden. And in this case, they can't say, well, they purposely suppressed it. Right. No one was suppressing it. Was, that was a leak. Yeah, it was deliberately taken out. Right. Nothing found. Yeah. That's right. right. So that would be, so the, the absence of evidence there would be evidence of absence. It's so, it's such, so broad, yes, that's right. <laughs> and that's a general argument you can make about conspiracy theories in general, is that, as you pointed out, it's very hard for any large government agency to do anything perfectly, have no witnesses and no leakers. And so they all, you know, this is the best argument against the 9-11 truthers is you now not one person has ever come forward and, and shown that there's anything behind that. And then no, no organization large enough to have enough people in it is ever going to have a perfect security. And all of a sooner or later, somebody leaks or somebody tells a story and you can't get, get out of it. And that's where Area 51, we can bring that into now. Uh, Area 51 definitely was a top secret project. It's an uh, isolated air base deliberately located in the middle of the Nevada desert. You can't see it from the ground. Uh, unless you hike far enough where you'd be captured. They have good security <laughs> around it, so you couldn't see it from the ground. For the longest time, nobody could see what was there because if you had tried to fly a plane over it, of course, it was restricted airspace, and the uh, Air Force would get you out of there quick. And only now, in the age of satellites, can you just type into Google Earth and see what Area 51 looks like. Mm -hmm. And it's really boring. It's just a dry lake bed with a couple of airstrips across it and a bunch of buildings. And the story behind it is it was actually right after World War II, uh, the CIA and Lockheed were building top secret spy planes and they couldn't test them out here in Palmdale at Edwards Air Force Base because they didn't want anyone to see what they were doing because they were in fact top secret and they knew Soviet spies would be looking for them. So they, Kelly, uh, uh, the, the uh, people who were the Lockheed Air Force designers actually flew over the area that's between the Nevada Test Range and Ellis Air Force Base in Nevada which is all government property where they test stuff and nuclear bombs in the 50s they were testing and found this isolated base that they could take over that no one could see anything, and this would be perfect for spy planes because once they get off the airstrip, they get high enough up that there's not much of a chance anyone's going to see much. That's what Area 51 was. It was for spy planes. First, it was the U-2. Uh, then they worked on the predecessor to the SR-71 Blackbird, and then the last plane that was that we officially know by release of secrets was, of course, the F-117 Stealth Fighter. All of which, after they were developed, were flown there secretly and then tested out of there. And they would fly at night a good part of the time, so they couldn't be seen well. And uh, this is where the entire Area 51 mythos grew up, because 
flying at night with these strange aircraft mm -hmm. that have enormous capabilities no other aircraft has, especially most of the sightings that were made of UFOs in the sky in that region through the entire period can be attributed to especially the Blackbird, which flies at 90,000 feet, right? And an aircraft pilot is flying about 40,000 feet, and the Blackbird can go at Mach 2. So he sees a disc-like object way above anything, anything he thinks that any aircraft could ever fly, because he doesn't know about top secret spy planes, flying way faster than he is, and he's of course transcontinental, and he thinks that's unidentified, that's something, but now of course all those have been identified. And so the story about that is, of course, eventually the CIA, through the Freedom of Information Act, was forced to release all the material about Area 51 in 2013. It's all public domain now. And it's all been out. And we actually had a, a speaker a few years ago about Area 51 who mined that for a book. And the people who were under you know, secrecy at the time, mostly Lockheed employees who worked on these aircraft, have all been allowed to speak now. And they're nicknamed the Roadrunners. They're actually a group of people who were <laughs> variously stationed at times during that uh, period when these are developed. And basically, number one, of course, the, they could never at that time explain what they were doing because it was top secret. And when the mythos of, of UFOs started to be hatched around Area 51, it was to their benefit because it was a cover story <laughs> that kept people from thinking of what was really going on. And so that worked very well. And it turns out I have a personal connection to it. My dad worked for Lockheed from 1938 till he retired in 1976. He did numerous flights, the so-called Janet flights, out of Vegas up to Area 51, which I never learned about until long after he retired and long after his secrecy had expired. And before he passed away, he told me he'd been to Area 51 several times. And there was nothing there but aircraft and aircraft equipment and aircraft hangars and testing. No aliens, no secret base underground. It's all Hollywood, and you guys believe too much crap that Hollywood gives you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have to picture these generals. Uh, watching these stories about UFOs going, oh, this is great, perfect. <laughs> yeah. If they only knew what we were really doing. <laughs> so uh, the SETI program has been going for over half a century. Still haven't yeah. found anything. The absence of evidence mm -hmm. there. Evidence of absence. There are no ETs out there. I, you want to go first, Tim? I have my <laughs> opinion. We have sort of a difference of opinion on this. Yeah, so. okay. Go ahead. Well, I'm of the rare earth hypothesis uh, a school, which is uh, that Peter Ward had written a book about it with uh, some other co-authors, Don, Don Brownlee, and there's a bunch of others who've argued about it. And what I find really important, and then lately now I'm teaching a lot of astronomy and planetary geology and meteorology, I've gotten very conscious of this, is how unusual Earth is. We don't really realize until we start looking all around the rest of the universe how unusual it is. Not just the Goldilocks effect of being the right distance away from the sun, so we're neither too hot nor too cold. That's why it's called the Goldilocks effect. But so far as we've identified, even though they're finding more planetary objects about the right size and the right distance from their, uh, their sun as they look, they're also not finding any more that have any evidence of free oxygen, which is a very rare thing. As far as we know, never found anywhere else in the universe, so far as it's been identified. And free oxygen may be unique to the Earth. Now, you, don't understand, you may not realize what that means. That means that if you don't have free oxygen, the only thing that live on that planet are either anaerobic bacteria, which I would grant is possible in other parts of the universe, or possibly the earliest plant-like organisms that can live in a CO2-rich environment without oxygen. But without oxygen, you surely can't have ET. You can't have an aerobic organism that even remotely resembles humans. Because you wouldn't have a metabolism. You wouldn't have evolve. metabolism. You wouldn't have any of the things that happen. And Stephen Jay Gould pointed this out very well, one of his frequent articles about this. Uh, the, the, we forget how much life is really a product of accidents. Of contingency is what he described it. We would not be here talking right now if some event hadn't had 66 million years ago that took out the Don Bird dinosaurs. There would be dinosaurs still roaming the earth, and you and I would still be little rat-sized things running underneath their feet. Okay, yeah. that mm -hmm. is a complete accident. There's nothing wrong with dinosaurs 66 million years ago, except the world went to hell. Okay, and they weren't becoming. They weren't becoming anything else. At very best, they would have been just like the Velociraptor in the movies, only maybe smarter but they're not necessarily gonna change into anything different, right? It was a total accident that we had inherited a world without the large dinosaurs and had 66 million years to evolve to things like primates and ourselves. And so Gould says over and over again, if you were to start the tape of life, let's say 600 million years ago when the first multicellular animals appear and run it all over again, you would never get the same result twice. We are not inevitable, in fact, we're not even likely to happen. Now you take that same argument and apply it to any other planet 
And the odds are, even if it involves something with oxygen, it's they're going to have something even remotely resembles us is pretty much uh, impossible. But let's go back one second. Now, so the oxygenated planets, how many of the exoplanets we found do we know what their atmosphere is? I'm not sure the number there, but the thing is with the spectroscopy you can do on planets now, they can estimate their atmosphere composition quite well. And that's huh. the striking thing as I've looked at it, is that we don't seem to see free oxygen. There are other coincidences. How, how would you see it in the atmosphere? Uh, no, the, the, the gases emit a uh, spectrograph. And you can look on the spectrograph, you can tell what gases are in it. We, that's how we sample all, you know, we have not been to most planets gas atmospheres, but we sample it by knowing what their spectrograph is. But I mean, I thought, I thought mo most of these exoplanets are just discovered by, they dim the light of the right. star. And those we don't know yet. Yeah. Okay. okay. Those we don't know yet. But the ones we do know, oxygen has not yet shown up in any okay. other place. There's a whole other line of coincidence too, being the right size to have certain things happen, to have a large moon. We have the largest moon relative to our size of anything which stabilizes our orbit. Uh, the Jupiter acts as a shield, so large objects rarely hit us because they're deflected by Jupiter's gravity. These are all accidental things that happen just because we are in the particular spot we are. And if any of them had been any different, there would not, we would not be here. And that's what I argue in this book, is that that's the rare Earth hypothesis. Too many things that are unusual that probably not seem to happen anywhere else as far as we can tell in the universe. To get us anywhere past, you know, we can have microbes that don't need oxygen. I would grant you that. But that's not going to phone home. The, uh, I, I could think of the, or there might well be uh, a bunch of aliens out there. But the other thing is that if, if it happens, it probably is, 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 is life is about as rare as diamonds, I would right. say. And, and that means there's diamonds, but you're not going to see too many. And Rare, but still. Still around, around but. Yeah, right. yeah. And there might be all kinds of reasons why they wouldn't contact. It might be Einstein's speed limit, that it's, or it might be that uh, we, might be the, we might be the number one. You know, we might be the first one. Somebody's got to be first. Somebody's got to be first. We, we might be, us. be the first one. Yeah. So that's kind yeah. of depressing. <laughs> thought, but, but uh, or another possibility is. They don't really want to contact us. <laughs> All right. I, mean, think the, about, I, would, I wouldn't want to be contacted either. <laughs> after this think point. about think about uh, <laughs> if they're if uh, they're two thousand years ahead of us. Think about the most advanced culture two thousand years ago, probably the right. Roman Empire, which right. made a, a spec. Their chief entertainment was a, making a spectacle of violent death. <laughs> most of their population were slaves. Uh, right. You know, it was a very brutal civilization. Uh, or, or go to China, where if you wanted to advance in the uh, civil service, you had to lose something. Right. The, uh, you it would be castrated in a, in a very brutal fashion, where they took everything off and put a cork in there. It was just a, it was horrific. And, and both these, uh, uh, just about every culture at that time, countenanced slavery. Which we today would find abominable. So your your point is what? Uh, My point is that aliens two thousand years ahead of us oh, see might this. not really want to. They think, oh look at this this bunch. They can't stop polluting their thing. That look at who they elected president. Look, <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, well, they, so I guess, but but, <clears throat> but the question is, Don, do, do we really know enough? I mean, Seth, Seth um, Shostak at yeah, SETI, you know, he always says, well, no, come, come on, we've just started looking. You know, it's, just, it's only a 50-year-old science. Um, I, I don't know that we know, definitely don't know enough, but I look at all the arguments and all the coincidences and all the extraordinary things that had to happen to make our planet suitable for advanced animal life or even simple animal life. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, all those events happening on, to me, makes the probability vanishingly small. Uh, but, especially but, for something that can communicate with us, yeah. But the number of opportunities is vanishingly huge. But they are also uh, at distances of gigantically far away, too. So. Well, yeah, so that we wouldn't have contact with aliens from a galaxy right. a billion light years away or something like that. Yeah, that's right. Because only so 2,000 years know. ago, we were slaughtering right, people right, in the Coliseum. Right. <laughs> well, but, I mean, in a way, you're making the argument that uh, Simon Conway Morris made for his, uh, what was the name of his book? Uh, uh, yeah, I know what you mean. It wasn't rare. Yeah, he rare was life. making the argument converge. But, but, but so let me, let me back up on that. So uh, uh, Richard Dawkins and I had a fun little debate a few years ago, because I always made fun about, uh, it, like I already did today, that um, you know, the aliens are not going to be bipedal primates with some gnarly stuff on their forehead speaking English, obviously. Uh, but Dawkins points out that, well, but on, on the other hand, might they not be, bi you got to have arm, arms and legs to move around. In a, in, a, in a land environment. And you're more likely to have your brain and sensory apparatus on one end and the waste disposal system at the other end. Mm -hmm. and so you're gonna, it won't be human, but it'll be something like us. 
Well, that, more likely have six legs, because that's the most successful organism on okay, this planet. Okay, so, so, you're, so, <laughs> so this is the argument from convergence, that evolution invents eyes, invents limbs, invents just basic stuff, hearing. If you're a fish, it invents a fusiform body that, that right. slides through the water better. Mm -hmm. Certain things will be invented over and over, and, 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 and you slightly disagree with that. Or you well, I, I, I actually wrote a very ne negative review of Conway Morris's book, because in the end you find out what he's trying to do is promote his religious viewpoint. He's a very religious Well, that's guy. what I'm getting at. You're not religious, and you're, you're agreeing no, no, with him. No, I actually way. disagree with that, because there's, you know, there's broad convergences where things are sort of constrained to do certain things simply, but there are, there are every possible combination of appendages, right, from two to four to eight to six and more, right, a millipede and a centipede have hundreds, uh, and there's no, no best way to do it. They all do it differently, so there's no constraint that we're going to have two arms and two legs. And as we were just pointing out, the most successful plant, organisms on the planet don't have four legs, they have six mm -hmm. insects, which greatly outnumber everything else on the planet by orders of magnitude. So if you want to guesstimate what's more likely to be an alien, and it's going to be more like an insect, and then it's going to be like us, just based on Earth. Uh, and then top it off, those convergences are only in the very superficial sense. They don't come in close enough to giving him all the kinds of things that we would take as, as typical of aliens that we've been told by our culture should look like. So whether they would even recognize them or not, it would be another thing. I mean, if you'd stop the clock 600 million years ago, the most advanced form of life on this planet was trilobites, sponges, and corals. Okay? Sponges and corals still do fine. Now, they're a technically an advanced form of life for a very specific niche, and they don't have a head or a tail. They don't have a front or a back. Right. They have a top and a bottom. That's all they have. They don't have an axis. <laughs> right. Yeah, so we tend to think of uh, evolution as progressing, but it, no, it's no. Not, not. Not at all. They do just fine with Some animals do fine with no brains. That's right. Yeah. Not necessary. Yeah, because, I mean, if brains were so great, how come hardly anybody has big brains? <laughs> uh, so apparently they're not well, that great. Anthropologists, of course, as you know, have answers to that, too. And the bigger problem is that our big brain is, is a big problem as far as how much we can develop inside the mother with a big brain and the small birth canal. Yeah. And so a lot of arguments have been made that that's one of the constraints that we had to essentially be born prematurely so that this giant brain of ours can develop out of the mother because it's too big to, to finish the whole thing inside. So. I just wrote one of my Scientific American columns, I'm not even sure it's out yet, called Sky Gods for Skeptics. <laughs> so it was, uh, th it was this theme, but there was a new study showing um, by social scientists that People that, uh, this is all self-report data, people that report having a high need of spirituality, uh, but they are not very religious, are more likely to believe in aliens and UFOs and, and that ET is probably out there, and, and, and vice versa. So the, the, the thesis was that the, the aliens essentially fill the role of, of a god, that right. if you don't believe in god traditionally, uh, but if you do, like Christians in particular, are less likely to believe in aliens right. than... They already have their aliens. They, they have their <laughs> advanced alien, essentially, yeah. We should give a plug, by the way, for the cover there. That's his wife Bonnie's artwork. Yeah. They did a very beautiful job, and Indiana loved it, so that's the source all right. of the cover art, which has many of the memes all in one Is that, is that Bonnie right there? Hi, Bonnie. Oh, Bonnie's here. Yes, good, hi, good. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, Bonnie. So... So would you scrap the SETI program yet, or just keep looking a little bit more? I would put my money on it, that's for sure. Okay, all right. Uh, I have money, better, better uses for my money. I mean, the, uh, even the idea that they're going to use radio waves, I mean, what? Come on, well, what are the was, chances? That would what? seem reasonable. I mean, they use something in the, in the electromagnetic spectrum, I would think. But, uh, because that's common throughout the universe. Yeah, right. I, yeah. Would, I would yeah. assume uh, the, uh, you know, I, I, I suspect they're out there, not, but, but it might be the rare, the, there's only one intelligent. Uh, per galaxy species, or per something. Galaxy. Yeah. yeah, we yeah. might. Uh, so right. forget about getting there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's, uh, it's, right. Uh, it's uh, the uh, the thing about the knobs on the faces. Of course, we're we're talking about uh, TV budgets. Right. Yeah. And, right. Yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> constraints, and also uh, there's uh, like the uh, the the common uh, version of, a, of an intelligent dinosaur, a dinosaur. Oh, right. They end up looking like us. You know, yeah. they, they put them with vertical posture. And that's oh, well, your it, colleague did that, right? Did yeah, Dale colleague of mine, Dale Russell, uh, mm -hmm. famously, mm -hmm. he took a, had an uh, artist construct a, a Stanichosaur, which is sort of like a, a velociraptor, 
and then he had to modify it and have it sort of a humanoid dinosaur. So it had it completely without a tail, standing erect, with big eyes, with the slits like a snake. And a spear. And, well, he didn't have a tool, but he did look very humanoid. Well, I thought I saw one with and a spear. And that was Dale yeah, Russell's okay. imagination right. gone berserk off. <laughs> uh, the story of a member of Dale Russell, he was always considered a little bit of a, a loose kettle. And uh, uh, my, my grad advisor knew him really well because he's actually a student. And he said, well, you know, we, we just didn't leave him around the camp with anything that could explode. <laughs> the other thing, the real problem about erect posture is that we've got all kinds of ailments. Yeah, oh, yeah you, you're artists, well adapted, yes. Yeah. Fallen arches, varicose veins, hernias, back problems, hemorrhoids, lower back problems, knee part problems. Of, part of the, the travail women go through in childbirth has to do with erect posture yeah, because yeah. if they're, if the birth canal were wide enough, that they could they could easily give birth with our big fat heads. Uh, women couldn't would walk, be yeah. waddling, you know. So. <laughs> but what, what about the argument that, that some people make? Well, w well, we're too anthropocentric or carbon-centric or whatever. Mm. They could be completely different, like a cloud of hydrogen gas could be intelligent or something uh, like that. That sounds almost like uh, the kind of belief that water has memory. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I, you know, what no, do we... There, the only alternative we have, you know, don't want carbon-based life, is silicon-based life. Yeah. Uh, silicon has the, the same spot in the periodic table, some of you know, has the same property that bonds to many other silicon atoms and many other kinds of atoms as well to make complex three-dimensional structures, which is what all rocks and minerals that are common in the Earth are made of. They're made of silicon, oxygen, and then <coughs> other elements. And so there have, actually has been speculation along those lines. And there was a famous <coughs> clay mineralogist by the name of Karen Smith, a Scotsman, who claimed that life originated as clay because clays <laughs> reproduce by copying themselves, you know, cloning themselves as they they form a large range of crystals, and if you have a crystal defect, it's like a mutation. It's copied by clays that copy off the first one, so they can transmit mutations. Uh, and they do all these other things except for few, few key biochemical things, of course, because they're not organic. And so his argument is that life started as clay, which copied itself, and then organic molecules latched onto this, and then became. Uh, and of course, it hasn't been taken very seriously since he first proposed it. Oh. But that's that's as far as I've ever heard of anyone saying you could base something lifelike on something other than carbon. And again, you can't get very far because you still end up with mud. So we know enough to know that we can say, you can't just say, as we know it, it could be something completely different. It probably can't be some, something completely different. Not unless it can different. bond and form complex three-dimensional structures, and there's only a couple of common elements in the entire okay. universe, right. carbon and silicon, that can do that. But the, the other thing is it, it would probably, if it was, say, a, a planet that's hotter, there was a, a silicon or fluorosilicon voice, it would still probably have to produce some kind of bilateral mobile creature right, with a, yeah, right, a, a right. brain that wouldn't be a Not cloud. a clay mineral, yeah. It wouldn't be right, a cloud of gas. Right. Uh, and we get with the cloud of gas thing, then we get to, of course, something that's not falsifiable. Yeah, right? yeah. So. And surely doesn't follow the laws of chemistry as we know it. <laughs> all right, so all the more reason to keep our planet uh, livable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no, there's no life for it out there, that's right. <laughs> Well, gentlemen, that, that was great. I want to, part of our salon uh, is a conversation with you, the audience. Uh, and, you know, not just short questions if you have comments, or particularly you, as long uh, as you question, students. Yeah. Uh, please, <laughs> please uh, uh, thank our, our speaker, our, our guests, and uh, let's open it up to questions. If you have any questions, or you were abducted, or <laughs> anything weird like that, who wants to go first? Yes. Do you see any connection between images like uh, the Virgin Guadalupe, the Lady of Fatima, having come down from some mysterious god? Does huh. that, yeah, how does that fit into your... Well, story? I like one of the most striking ones is uh, uh, Betty Hill. Uh, Betty and Barney Hill, yeah. Yeah, Betty and Barney Hill, that she said the <laughs> aliens, that they stuck this big needle into our navel. And then she said, don't put it, it hurts, it hurts, and the alien waved his hand and the pain went away. And the interesting thing is that there's a very strong parallel of that into the ecstasy of St. Teresa of Avila, who said an angel came down to her and it thrust a lance into her abdomen. And uh, it caused her pain, but also great bliss. And uh, that's <laughs> a <laughs> so I have to be a little it's very broad here. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, it it sounds sounds very it sounds like an etherealized version of sex, basically. But, but the thing is that there's you know uh, uh, 
if we have MRIs and CAT scans, the aliens are likely to have something even better. They won't really do stick a needle into her navel. <laughs> uh, or even if they did, if they were going to do a, like a biopsy. I was president of the biopsy when I was a hospital corpsman in the Navy. And it didn't cause the guy any pain, even though, though the doctor stuck a thing in and got a piece of his liver. Uh, because, of course, they anesthetized it. And you know, we kind of I got to assume that if we got a technology, the aliens would have it too. <laughs> yeah, or even more so. You, so, uh, there, so I would see that. There is also, uh, I don't know about the Virgin of Guadalupe being a, something like that, but there is the idea of, uh, at least with the Nordic aliens, that they're these wonderful godlike beings are coming down and they're going to save us. Quite often it's coupled with the evil reptilians who are uh, <laughs> in, in conflict with the Nordics and so on and so on. So. I don't know if that answers your question, but it's fair. So. What else? Bob, did you have a question too? You wrote your hand. Well, I was just going to say, it's always kind of disappointing to come to a meeting like this and find out that we are, in fact, the top of the other. This is it. <laughs> <laughs> this is it. There's a whole out there, so we're going to come down. You know, I could have yours still, which is great. Yeah. And, and kind of rectify everything. No, it's up to us. Yes, sir. Well, we're talking about life forms and silicon and carbon, and, and what, what popped into my mind was a, a lot of belief of like energy. Uh, you know, there's you know the soul, or there's some something that doesn't yeah. have mass, and uh, it, but, but yet it has some kind of, of uh, intelligence. I mean, is this just I think that's a little bit too sci-fi. That yeah. it's, it's, it's also well. I mean, it's a, it's a part of the subject. Of one of my next book, Heavens on Earth, about the the singularity and all the scientific attempts to achieve immortality, including copying the connectome, uh, which is the your your, um, your sort of neuro, neurological equivalent of the genome, all your connections. Right. But but so they're going to take a, a fit, the, the idea is is you take a copy of a physical structure and you convert it to essentially digits. It's a, it's a computer program. Now it would be pretty massively big to, to keep track of all the, you know, 100 billion neurons or 85 billion or whatever times a thousand interconnections for each of them. You know, it's trillion. So I mean, the, the, the file size would be massive, but their argument is that more, follow Moore's law out and we'll get there. Um, and, and so essentially you're converting a physical structure into information. And so their argument is that when you turn on the computer, you're in the computer. I don't think so. <laughs> I, I think it's just a copy. If you could even do this, which, which is not going to happen anytime soon. But even if you could, you're not Johnny Depp waking up inside the computer in transcendence going, hello, here I am. <laughs> I'm in here now. Uh, I, your point of view would not move with the, the, the floppy disk or the, the, you know, the program you're going to upload to the cloud or whatever. Isn't that really what artificial intelligence Yes, well, that's the idea. Yeah, it's just. But it has to have some kind of material basis. It's not just right. energy floating in nothing, right? It's yeah, right. electrons in the case we're talking about here, which has to be transmitted through some kind of a, a wiring or some kind of a circuitry. Yes. So there's a physical basis to everything. Oh, that's right. The cloud is actually server somewhere. Yeah, it is a server somewhere, right? <laughs> Even if it's in the atmosphere above us, it has a ba physical basis. Got a question from Facebook. Okay, got a Facebook question here. Um, for a second, it is, uh, what are your views on the Rendlesham Forest oh, incident uh, in 1980? Uh, why do you think John Burroughs' medical records from the incident are still classified? Okay, go ahead. Well, I don't know about his uh, medical records being still classified, but uh, the Rendlesham Forest is a classic case of, of myth-making that gets blown out of, uh, uh, and the original, uh, I can't remember the fellow's name, who said he saw it, uh, the object touched it. And, and the, his first description is he got within 30 meters of something, this light. And that's as close as he got. Then over the years, something evolved where he, he came up and he touched it. Oh. And then uh, finally it morphed into them not being aliens after all, but time travelers from the future who were communicating with him and that, that he got this telepathic thing in his mind saying that, uh, you know, patterns of zeros and ones, so he realized that's computer code. 
Okay. <laughs> so, so the story changed. Yeah, yeah, it just changed and grew, and uh, there's all kinds of things. Like they, they heard something that sounded like a, a woman's scream, and it turns out that the forest has these things called muntjac deer. They originally came from uh, Asia. Yeah. Asia, yeah, and they were brought in as a, on a game reserve and escaped, and there's kind of a pest, but they. They, they'll give off this kind of mating cry that sounds like a, a shriek. Oh, I see. And, <laughs> right. uh, and, it, and of course, a lot of guys tromping through the forest, and, and it said that all the animals in, in farm areas were, seemed nervous. Well, what was making them nervous was all these guys clomping through the forest with flashlights and stuff uh, in right. the middle of the night. Right. And, uh, and it's just, uh, it's, it, the more you investigate it, the more it unravels. It's, right, uh, right. Uh, I find this, this happens all the time whenever I appear on shows. It's like, what about this particular one? If you don't know it, mm -hmm. then it looks like, oh, okay, this could be the one. Yeah. Um, but anyone who spends the time and does the research and yeah, digs into the it, story, it usually it ends be, up falling apart right, because the right. witnesses are inconsistent, the records are very old, there's nobody who was actually a real witness that left anything you know, right. pretty good. That's the same way with Roswell. Roswell's a story that grew completely out of myth-making 30 years after it was a story that had been forgotten. Yep. What else? Anybody up upstairs? Up in the sky? Michael? In the cloud? Yeah. Um, you know, I'd like to uh, understand what you uh, present in the book, if you do, about the, you know, let's say the sociology, anthropology of uh, backgrounds, you know, what groups uh, might have, you know, more tendency and stuff. And I'm thinking specifically just you know, my own experience. I came of age with amateur professional astronomers, and that's one group that they don't have any good UFO stories. <laughs> uh, they to me, maybe I'm saying because they know what a real them, thing looks like. But yeah. I explain them. Uh, but you know, you go to a star party in an amateur, uh, you know, astronomy, and you know the aliens don't show up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I just but you know the the, the Harvard study, not the not the crazy Harvard professor, but the other one that about ten years ago you had a. Yeah. Tommy uh, John Mack and the, uh, the with the Betty Barney Hill story is that one you're thinking of? No, I think he's thinking no, of no, Susan Clancy's uh, oh, right, right, right. research yeah. on abductees and their narratives. She did analysis of their yeah. narrative yeah. stories. Okay. But the interesting thing was they weren't sort of viable. But they weren't crazy. No, no, they were normal you people. Know, so pretty that's normal. what I thought. That's what I thought. Relatively that's normal. That's yeah. Nice. What so do you I mean by normal? Uh, well, I, yeah. Go ahead. I think Susan that? Clancy said that a lot of them were a little bit odd. She said they were of a schizoid personality, which isn't. <laughs> Doesn't mean they're schizophrenic, but they're a little bit prone to fantasy thinking in a lot right. of cases. Yeah. Uh, interesting, uh, as far as culture goes, with the notable exception of Barney Hill, uh, so Betty's white and he's black, uh, not, not too many abductees or anything, but but wasps. <laughs> I see. I see. Yes, right. The ones who actually watch a lot of TV and have a lot of exposure well, it, to the media. It's, it's part of our white patriarchy. Yeah. We <laughs> have the power, so the aliens only talk to us. <laughs> oh boy. And it's also I'm getting in trouble for that. A lot, one, lot more in America than elsewhere. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very much America centered. Yeah. yeah. There is English crop circles, but we are very much the hub, so, hub of alien stories. It's like, it's like reincarnation. All the souls seem to hover around the Indian subcontinent waiting for... <laughs> for they never come to America. Well, yeah. I, I had a question about the role of authority. Uh, it seems like a lot of these aliens either have some authority that they bring with them in people's minds, or they exist despite what the authorities are telling us. And uh, I was just wondering if you had any more to uh, add to that. Well, there is there is a theory about conspiracy theories by a sociologist. Uh, I forget the name of the book, but that uh, conspiracy theories have have to do with power. Yeah. And, and usually, the conspiracy theorists are the people out of power, mm -hmm. and they think people in corporations and government agencies have more power than they actually do. Uh, and so, it's kind of a power imbalance. That's right. his theory about that. So, it could be something like that. Got one more. From yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. What do you guys think about the disclosure project? Oh, yeah. I don't yeah. know that one. I, I haven't heard of that. What's, oh, what's, well, this is, uh, this is the Disclosure Project. It was about maybe 10 years ago now uh, of uh, these people holding these press conferences saying we're going to disclose what's really going on. Uh, there's a book, for example, uh, um, uh, Keen, Jessica Keen, I think her name was, an investigative journalist who uh, interviewed all these generals and admirals and 
you know, people with good titles, as if if you have a title, your observational skills are better yeah, or something. Yeah. That's what a lot of those guys believe. It, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, and so the idea was that these people are coming forward from the 50s and 60s now that they're retired but not quite dead, and they could tell what really happened. And so, uh, like, I reviewed that book for Scientific American. It was like uh, it was like U UFOs that you know generals go on record or, or something like that. And um, but again, it was this you know here is the account uh, of what was said. Uh, originally, and then here's how it gets translated into the stories and it gets passed along. And it was like it moved at a very rapid p uh, speed to it, it was lightning fast, to it was unimaginably fast. Yeah, yeah, or, yeah. you know, it was, it was pretty big, to it was 300 meters across. W mm -hmm. Wait a minute, how do you know exactly how many meters across it was? Mm -hmm. um, and, so I, and so I found that, you know, in the retelling of the stories, even the accounts by the General. Big fish and, story over and over again. Yeah. It, it's, it's pretty much like that. Yeah. Um, there's, there's a funny cartoon that was talking about this business, the WikiLeaks, and the, no secret goes un, uh, unexposed sooner or later. Uh, the uh, man and woman are just he waking up in bed. He said, oh, my God, I just realized Trump is now president. If there was some UFOs, we'd have heard about it by now. <laughs> <laughs> he can't keep his mouth shut. That's right. Yeah, he would have he tweeted it out already. That's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yep. Yeah, there's actually a great uh, uh, clip from uh, Bill Clinton on, uh, I think it was Jimmy Kimmel, or it might have been Leno, I guess, at the time. This was the 90s. Yeah, it would have been Leno. You know, and he asked him, I think he asked him, it, if something was at Roswell, really aliens or something, would you tell us? And he said, yeah, I would tell you. Of course, the ufologists go, no, he wouldn't. He would lie. <laughs> then how do you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. How, there's no way to test it if everything's a lie. Yeah. Um, I have a question about us maybe being, having a carbon bias about right. life. Carbon yeah. chauvinism, yeah. In, in, in terms of the fact that you have on other worlds you have these constraints of pressure and temperature yeah. and, and, and so would it be possible for there to be some totally different kind of a biochemistry that we can't even... The non-carbon bores line. Yeah, because, because here on Earth, the constraints that have made biochemistry based on carbon possible, those constraints have been around long enough to create the kind of stability for us to be here. Would it be possible for different constraints yeah. Well, there's, well, there's, there's one still have to be based on carbon or right. silicon. Yeah, but there is one constraint, and that is the way in which chemical bonds operate under any set of pressures. Okay, okay. and then only carbon and silicon are common enough in the universe, based on all the data we have now, to operate as the central thing for a complex molecule or complex structure. All the rest of the atoms in the universe are on the other extremes of the periodic table, where they only bond in simple ionic fashion, and they don't form complex multi-dimensional structures. And so it's, there's no accident that only two things we see commonly in any system, and this is other planets we've looked at now, are complex carbon molecules and complex silicon molecules. Nothing else can bond that way because they're the only two in the periodic table that have that property and they're common enough. The, uh, there's uh, the late uh, Dr. Isaac Asimov, who uh, along with being a science fiction writer, was a science opera and was a biochemist, yep. uh, wrote a, a great little essay, I think in the early 60s, and you can probably find it online, called Not As We Know It, in which he speculated on the possibilities. He, he said, perhaps if, we, if you had uh, uh, slightly less stable proteins in a, an atmosphere that was dominated by ammonia, that you could have a, you know, something like an Earth-type planet in the, out where the outer planets are. Uh, so he speculated that, is a, that we have protein and water is our basic, the, is the, the water is the medium and the proteins are the main uh, actors. He suspected a, a, a protein analog in liquid ammonia. And then he said possibly it could be a, a complex lipid in liquid methane. Right. Or even cooler, a complex lipid in, in liquid uh, hydrogen. And they, on the other end, he thought of fluorosilicones, uh, alternating yeah. carbon fluor. Silicon, yeah. uh, CFCs. With, with uh, thing in, in liquid sulfur. Yeah. And uh, so on. So he's. But you're only talking about a molecule that's only so big. You're not talking about an alien communicating with so us. It, it's, <laughs> so it, it, it's conceivable that they, they could be there. Uh, and uh, thing. But we still are talking about something that we will, will have, would have to be an animal, not biochemically, but, but what an animal does, an animal is, is something that has a gut. That, that has, to eat, out of resources, has yeah. to eat something else to, to do it, and which 
In order to do that, it has to move around, and then it has to have sensory organs, and then they tend to mass, and there's a ganglion there that forms a brain. So we're going to have something that's, regardless of its biochemistry, is going to be somewhat, you know, probably an animal of some kind. It's bilaterally symmetry, symmetrical, and uh, but that beyond that, we can't say what it would be like. So. Did, yeah. Uh, getting back to SETI for just a moment, um, I was a bit surprised that Stephen Hawking said, well, you better be a little bit careful because oh, yes. you may run into <laughs> the evil aliens. aliens. <laughs> and I was wondering to what extent you agree I have that concern or maybe don't have that concern. Well, I'm not worried about it. Well, you think we're alone, so yeah. they can't be evil because they don't even exist. <laughs> well, the other thing is, remember that these people capable of crossing interstellar space, in order to be able to do that, they've got to have taken care of their uh, ma material and energy needs. Yeah. Right. And they don't, you know, they, they may not really want to land on our planet and, you know, pick up Pseudomonas that might infect them. Or <laughs> Back to H.G. Wells again, yes. Yeah, right. so, so a lot of bacteria probably wouldn't attack them, and viruses might not attack them, so they might have a totally different genetic code. But uh, Pseudomonas, uh, well, there's some, some species of Pseudomonas that can eat hydrocarbons as energy source. Yeah, they, yeah. And they could, they could probably adapt to doing it. But, so one, there's no, no real desire, need they would have to be to, to conquer us. Uh, conquer uh, the, contrary to Hollywood script writers, yes. yes. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. Plus, I would argue that to become a, a viable spacefaring civilization, you can't be a colonizer, enslaver, because yeah. that's not a sustainable system. Mm -hmm. yeah. I could be wrong. Let's, mm -hmm. let's yeah. Oh, let me, go, let me go up here, sorry. Let's go back to where you're talking about um, religious reference uh, that believe in UFOs, perhaps. Um, and I think maybe I noticed some just you're saying not so much Christianity, but or, or do you do know Christianity? I'm thinking about uh, ladders and wheels and Oh. Angels, archangels, and yeah. chariots in the sky. Sounds a lot like uh, Ezekiel's uh, vision. So, so they, are there Christians that might make that argument that there clearly is references to what might be UFOs? In the yeah, the, uh, the thing about Ezekiel, if you read it, uh, it's hard. To, about the only thing that sounds like a flying saucer is wheels within wheels. The, the animals are, you know, they have four faces. One that's a bee, uh, an eagle in the back and a lion on one side, <laughs> man on it, 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 all of which have to do with the cherubim, uh, which were composite angels that had uh, four parts of a lion, the hind quarter of an ox, uh, wings of the eagles, and the uh, head of a man. Uh, and then uh, the uh, Christian, uh, Christian views on UFOs are interesting because there are a lot of Christians who are very uh, fundamentalists particularly, who don't like the idea of uh, the UFOs as being, because they sound too new agey, so they're or actually... Or they mean that we're not alone and God has became a special <laughs> yeah. Or, or the, the, well, they say they're, they're demons. Yeah. And they're leading us astray. <laughs> now, I didn't include in the book the, the uh, abduction of Betty Andres Andresen because it was just too silly. Uh, but, but she, but the gray aliens who abducted her told her telepathically, we are followers of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. <laughs> so it, again, course, it reflects right, her right. belief system and a great uh, mashup of multiple <laughs> media. So it's uh, uh, I don't know if that answers your question or not. But uh, <laughs> I just, uh, what? Going back to, are there Christians that would make the argument that the Bible and, and Jewish people? Yes, usually, you usually. Uh, usually, most Christians don't. They they say they're angels. Yeah, you know, they and, much prefer that meme. You know. Although the ancient alien proponents do oh, yeah. make that argument. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. That the, again, the people at the time wouldn't have called them spaceships. They didn't know, but they call them in the language of their time. <coughs> but they were really describing extraterrestrials. Yeah. Anyway, that's the ancient alien hypothesis. Yes. Um, so I was wondering if would you consider placebo as kind of the basis as to why um, the psychology of why people would believe that? Um, and are here. Yeah, I think it's it's in part just we're hardwired to find patterns and meaning right. in everything we look at. Yeah, it's all about we have to have mystery in our life. Apparently, that's something we're hardwired to do. We always have to have something we don't understand is not explained. So, for many people, that's religious mysteries. 
For others, it's Bigfoot. It's a book I worked on a few years ago. For others, it's aliens. But it's very hard for humans not to have something mysterious that they don't understand that gives them a sense of meaning. And I think that is hardwired into us, and that's what sustains a lot of this mythos. Uh, well, I was just going to say that this is a little off yet, uh, but I, I was looking at my email a couple days ago and I saw that uh, Richard Dawkins is here uh, in Glendale in two weeks uh, with the, uh, at the Alex Theater with uh, Michael Lewis. <laughs> and they're both, I, and I just did, I didn't, I mean, I, I didn't know if anybody knew anything about that, especially you, that. Know. He seems to cross the pond a lot. Like yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, right. he's, uh, right. yes uh, he's like in this, I did not know he was back in town, but if you should go see him, I would recommend that. It's a good show. Yeah. Just watch out for the airplane. Bob? <laughs> oh, I had a question. Tim brought up a, an interesting point that to be a life form, you need supporting life forms. Yeah. You know, the big fish eating the smaller fish eating the smaller fish. So, you know, we have a support uh, matrix around us of, of animals and such we live off of, wouldn't another life form, whether it's silicon or whatever, also need yeah. some support system right. animals? And the bigger it is, the more it requires a bigger prey, yeah. right? Yeah. Even if silicon is like off, that. but yeah. an advanced civilization might do a better job. Yeah. The Von Daniken thing, yes. Yeah. But they were, the, and they were part of kind of like, if it's another explanation for us to have like a higher being that helped us, you know, come to the development of it. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah. The we aliens go. are here. <laughs> Perfect sound effect. We are humbled. <laughs> Great. <laughs> okay, whose ringtone was that? <laughs> Go ahead, Tim. You know all about that story. Well, uh, Skeptics, what do we know? <laughs> I would have to say, and I, I, I have to phrase this carefully to avoid libel suits. In my opinion, the purveyors of the ancient alien uh, hypothesis are charlatans. Yeah. Uh, it, they're doing it for the money. You know, von Daniken sold a whole bunch of books and such, and uh, there was a great uh, interview with him in the 1970s. Uh, a science writer named Timothy Ferris yeah. interviewed him in Playboy and just ripped him a new one. Basically, it was uh, it was yeah. kind of saw how absurd it was that he was yeah. made these claims and he said, but, but so I just talked to so and so who said he never took you to these caves in Peru where there's plastic furniture and all this. And <laughs> I said, well, uh, he hemmed and hawed and, and so he lied. Yeah, 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 it yeah. was and, and yeah. Uh, the. Uh, uh, the ancient aliens things, I ran down all of their, their things that were, and you, the, the so-called Baghdad battery is a great one because it, it's, a, it's a jug and it's got a sleeve of one metal and a rod of another metal. And that's it. <laughs> that's all. That's, there isn't any great battery there. The, the Parthians didn't have, have batteries or anything, and of course there's no supporting technology for it anyway, but... <laughs> or anything uh, they use it for. <laughs> the, uh, uh, one of the, the more interesting ones was the Delhi Iron Pillar that uh, has not rusted in like 600 years or some amazing thing. What's funny about it is that it turns out that it's because of a more primitive technology that hasn't rusted, yeah. because our technology with the blast furnace is, is very effective at moving, removing impurities and therefore there's no, not a phosphorus and stuff. And the, the phosphorus that's left in the, uh, the old way of doing with smelting will form a, a material called miso white, which is a protective film. So it'll start to rust a little bit on the surface and then this protective film will form and yeah. keep it from rusting. Yeah. So ironically, <laughs> it's, it's not rusting because it's an inferior right, technology. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> the direct answer to your question though, the thing is that all these guys say, well, you can't imagine humans ever building the pyramids. It just shows their failure of imagination, also their failure to appreciate that ancient technologies were very sophisticated. They may not be modern and may not be ours, but they knew how to roll large blocks of, of limestone across the Giza Plateau and to lever them up and, 
and they had millions of slaves over the years to put that together. It wasn't anything that required any great technology that, that, that was not known in 400, 500 BC at least. There's a, uh, a great series, uh, Chris White, who yes, uh, yes. I disagree with him, of course, on the Noah's Flood things. He, he's a, 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 an evangelical Christian, but he had been formerly a follower of them, and he went, a, he, it's a series called Ancient Aliens Debunked, and he goes into detail <laughs> just. Yeah, it's a good series on YouTube you can watch, yeah. really, really so, good. Yeah, it's good to remember. I mean, we, we tend to try to give people the benefit of the doubt. You know, they were confabulating. They, they hallucinated. It was an illusion. They, they honestly misunderstood. We also have to acknowledge people just make stuff up and lie all especially the time. When there's, <laughs> especially all the when there's time. money to be made. Yeah, if yeah. there's money. I mean, yeah. Roswell, New Mexico makes its money off the UFL yeah. agents. Yeah. So does Loch Ness. You know, it's a huge Loch Ness tourist industry. You go to Willow Creek, California, their entire economy is based on Bigfoot. <laughs> right? These, kind of, these cities don't have any reason to tell you the truth about these myths. Right? They, they have money to be made. Yeah. I just want to add to that, if you, you know, now with cable, if you go on the History Channel or you go on Animal Planet, they've got their Bigfoot show, they've got oh, yeah. Their, oh, yeah. they, and you know, it gets ratings because yeah. people are, you know, yeah. they like that mystery. Yeah, I blogged about that a few years ago. What happened is that when the the uh, laws on, on uh, communications changed in the late 1980s. They deregulated it. We had all these slew of specialized cable channels. At one time, believe it or not, the Learning Channel, the History Channel, they actually had learning and history on it. Right? <laughs> but what's happened is all these stations are commercial, as you know, because you watch them and you get interrupted by crappy commercials all the time. And they ultimately end up, like every other thing that's commercial, they have to appeal to the lowest common denominator. But the only thing they haven't tried to very often is pro wrestling. And that would be the final sign that they've gone down the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've been going an hour and 45 minutes. I, uh, I don't want to exhaust your patience. And there's, uh, we want to leave time to get your book signed. We have wine and food and Snapple for you kids. <laughs> show, your, some, show your ID. Yes, sir. And some uh, birthday cake. And a happy birthday, Tim. Happy birthday, it. Terry. Yeah. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thank Let's you. give our guests yeah. a, a, another round of applause. Thank you. And you can get your book signed right now. Thank you for watching. Check us out at skeptic.com and support our mission to promote science and critical thinking at Patreon. <laughs>